and welcome back to my channel. In today's video, I will be giving you my top tips for selling crochet products at craft fairs or craft shows or market events or whatever you call them. Technically, those terms do mean different things, but they're oftentimes used interchangeably. So whatever you call it, if you sell crochet in person, these tips will be beneficial to you. I do not proclaim to be any sort of expert, but I do have experience selling crochet at craft fairs and I do have a degree in marketing and I've taken classes in like brand psychology and whatnot. So I do think I have valuable information to share, but you guys feel free to let me know in the comments if you would agree or disagree with these tips. And just real quick, I will take the time to ask you guys to subscribe. Uh, because our next giveaway is going to be at a thousand subscribers and 4,000 watch hours and you guys can get us there faster if you're watching this video and not subscribed by subscribing. Uh, and if you'd like to see the products I gave away to our last winner, so you could watch this video right here so you can kind of see what you could be in store for for our next giveaway. Now, if you see me looking over here, it's because I wrote notes down so I make sure not to like forget anything that I wanted to cover in this video. Now, the first tip is to pick reputable events to sell at. Now, the way I do it is through Facebook, but you can also use Google or word of mouth. I really like Facebook because if I've not heard of the event before, typically there's going to be clues to if the event is a good event because you could see how many people are going or maybe going. You could also see if the event is at like a venue that like exists outside of the event. Like I sell at a farmer's market, so they have like their own actual like Facebook page, not just like an event they created. So I could see how many people have like interacted with the venue page as well. Um, and usually there's also like feedback on the vendor like page uh, that cues me into whether like that's a good event or those are good people to like work with. And another benefit to them having their own like business page would be you being able to see ahead of time if they're publicizing the event and how well they're publicizing the event and what kind of engagement they're getting on their posts publicizing the event. So I really like Facebook. Typically you can find these events by typing in like market events near me um, and then you can kind of go from there. So find reputable events, make sure that you could see some type of like social proof that this is like event an event that is like not a scam because some people will make up like events that look similar to actual events that are happening but are not and they are just trying to collect your money be aware that that's a thing and then if you're ever not sure you could do what I've done in the past and I just recently did it for an event that's supposed to be in November Obviously, since it's so far out in advance, there's not an event thing made for it on Facebook yet. And even on the like calendar for that venue, it's not listed yet. So what I did is I called the place that it's supposed to be happening at, which is like a country club, and asked their event coordinator, like, hey, is this event actually happening there? And like, who's hosting it? Because like, they said I was approved as a vendor, but are trying to collect money. And I just want to know before I give them my monies. <laughs> is it real? And it did turn out to be real. And they said yes. And they had actually just done the coordinator or the people doing the event, like the event hosts had just actually done an event at the same location. And I was told by the like person that does the events at that location, not the person hosting the event, that it was like successful. So there's like multiple people that you could be talking to when dealing with the events. There's a person actually hosting or like the business actually hosting the event. And then there's the, like, person that, like, owns the venue that the event is at. You see what I'm saying? You can, like, fact check things by talking to, like, the different people involved. Keep that in mind. My next tip is to plan your stock accordingly. If you're being told that the event last time had, like, a thousand people that went and you're only planning on bringing $500 worth of stock, you might want to skip it or find a smaller event because... Well, you'll probably still make sales, you're going to pay more for bigger events. And I know people want to sell out and like that seems great, like a job well done. But if you sell out, that should be your cue that you have under prepped. You have missed out on potentially selling more because you ran out of stock. Selling out for me uh, is a bad thing. If you sell out, especially if it's early in the event, you did not make enough items. So like just keep that in mind. Now, if your sales goal is to make $500 and you only bring $500 in stock, again, those things aren't lining up. So plan your stock 
with the size of the event and how much you want to make in mind. A good rule of thumb that I've seen passed around is if you want to make $500, bring at least $1,000 worth of product. Now, in my experience, and I don't know if this is true for everybody, but it's at least been relatively true for me, uh, I actually tend to sell about 10% of my stock, meaning if I've brought $1,000 worth of items, I could usually expect to make somewhere around the $100 mark. So if you want to, at least according to what's been relatively true for me, if you, you want to sell $400 worth of stock, you should aim to bring $4,000 worth of stock. I don't, like I said, I do not know if that's true for everybody, but that at least has been a trend for me most of the time with the markets around me. And I live in like northernish central Florida. You let me know if you've noticed a trend like that, if you sell about 10% of your stock at each event, let me know because I'm curious. I wondered if that was like just true for me and not for everybody. Like I said, the point of that is to just plan your stock accordingly and keep the size of the event in mind and keep how much you want to make in mind and make sure it makes sense what you're bringing and like how much you're bringing. I have a video for how I gamify my market prep because sometimes it can be a little monotonous if you try to make like 20 of like your smaller items and things to have low priced cute items that people like. So I found a way that I gamify it and it works to keep things like fun for me. And I will link that video right here if you've not seen that. Now we're going to get into the real meat and potatoes of this video, which are my tips specifically pertaining to setup, because I know a lot of people have questions about their setup. Now, one thing that you might have heard is vertical displays build upward. It catches eyes. And I do agree with that. But I also think people kind of misunderstand and this. Now, if your target customer is an adult, absolutely build upward. Make sure that your like best products are at eye level to the customer. In fact, in grocery stores, because the target client is a an adult with money, uh, people like businesses will pay to make sure their products are at eye level. But if you're like me and sell cute little Ami Grimmy plushies, a lot of my customers tend to actually be children. So when people say eye level, that is actually going to be on the table. So if you have things that might be interesting for kids, like cute little plush toys and plush unicorns and plush dinosaurs and plush octopus octopi, don't be afraid to put things in bins just on the table. I know that's been like shamed so many times in the world of like craft fair. Don't just put things on the table. But like if you're selling to a kid, that's at eye level to the kid. So I have bins on table, on bins on tables, and I actually found these little pedestals for like a couple of bucks at Hobby Lobby. So in the bin or right behind the bin, I will put a pedestal. They're like the top of it's like that big with one of the products on it. So one of the products is on it, the kid can see it, and then there's like a whole bunch of bins of like cute little colorful things. So that's my tip there. Don't be afraid to use the table, but you can also take advantage of vertical height too depending on who you specifically are trying to sell to. Like I said, a lot of my stuff is for kids, but I put my more expensive, more detailed, more time consuming items up high because adults will appreciate it a little more. So I like try to hit both areas. Like my headbands, they're mommy and me sets. So I have a head on a mannequin. I have a mannequin head on like a stick. So it's at eye level for an adult. So they'll be like, oh, these are cute. And then I could be like, that's part of a mommy and me set if you want it. You could buy the big one for you and a little one for the baby. And it's each of them's $18. But if you get it in a set, they're actually two for 30. So just keep that kind of thing in mind where you're putting your products. Um, and don't think that vertical height is the end all be all. The next thing is to try to, if you can, put your best sellers or if you don't have any best sellers yet, your like showstopper items toward the front of your booth to draw people in. Now, my headbands are not my best sellers. But I do get like a ridiculous amount of compliments on my twist headbands. So I actually have those at the like end of my booth. It'd be the first thing you see if you walk in and or are walking by. And I like angle the mannequin head. So if you're coming from like the side as people do when they walk like in front of your booth, usually the like flow of traffic is perpendicular to the front of your booth. So I angle the mannequin head. So the first thing they can see is like this mannequin head wearing the cute little twist headband and like the headbands on the table. And then I have my scrunchie display right next to that. And there's a lot of color on that. Scrunchies are one of my best sellers. And they're my baby's yelling. He's not upset. He's just in his crib getting up from a nap playing. So if you hear that, uh, he's fine and I will get him. 
just as soon as I'm done, unless he starts freaking out, and in which case I will get him now. Put your bestsellers toward the front because it can draw people in, and then make sure that you're stocking your booth with, like, a general, like, flow of traffic in mind. If people are coming from this way and the first thing they see is the, like, headband and scrunchie display, then it moves them in a natural flow of traffic around my booth like this. So this is headband scrunchie keychain. Then right in the front, when you're looking directly in my booth, is all my Amigurumi stuff. And then I have, like, more Amigurumi stuff and my email sign-up on this table on the opposite side of what they see first with my clearance bin and then they can like leave. The clearance bin and the email sign up which gives them 10 or 15 percent off is like my last chance basically to try to like get a sale. So they'll see that last and I'll be like oh if you are interested in something that you've just seen I am running like a special right now if you sign up for my email list you can get 15 percent off your purchase today and that's also where I have my business card and I say like if you're not interested in anything today but did like my products feel free to grab a business card I also sell online on Etsy and you know I at least get them walking out so keep a flow of traffic in mind and if I get to the event and I see that the flow of traffic is supposed to come from the other way I know how I'm like setting up my booth so I can just like switch it to where like the headbands would be over here the homie grimmy would be here and then the email sign up would be here. So it works the same, but like in reverse, which brings me to my next point, uh, like do a trial run ahead of time. So you know how you're going to set up your things and be flexible with how you set up your things. I know my general setup and can modify it from like event to event. Like with that example I just used, if the flow of traffic is different than I like pictured in my head when I was doing my setup, I can just quickly swap it and then keep the like, expected flow that I have for my booth. Now, does every single person come in and like walk the perfect circle and then leave? No, but most of them do follow that like natural progression. Some people will happen to see my booth from like directly across the way. So they'll be line it right to like my Amigurumi that's front and center without ever looking at the side tables. But generally speaking, you're usually going to get customers from walking by. So always do a trial setup so you have a general idea of like where you want your things and your like perceived path like around your booth and make sure it makes sense and customers can get in and around. I have my table set up. I mean, you could see it in this video right here, but I'll explain it real quick. I have a four foot table going down, then a six foot table going across. So they make an L right at the entrance and it, the like back of the L, the short part, or I guess it would be the long part, but the... The six foot table runs parallel to my entrance and like the back wall. And then I have another six foot table over here that has um, some stuff on it too. So there is like a little opening where the tables don't meet over here. And that's where my chair goes. And then my spouse comes with me. So he'll be behind the six foot table. Um, and he can get out the back if he needs to or come around and get out the little like opening between the tables. I hope that makes sense. If it didn't, you can see it in this video right here. And that works because I have access to the customer uh, to collect cards, to collect money. They have access to me. I can like pop out of there, reset up things because like as people come in and touch stuff, um, sometimes they don't put it back right, especially if you have kids touch your stuff like I do all the time because my demographic a lot of the times is kids. So I can just pop out and like tidy up in between customers and you know, it works. I have thought about adding another four foot table to like make 10 foot of table and then like a U shape, like a closed U shape, but I'm still kind of unsure about that because that would block my entrance out, but I could always go around my booth. But a lot of the times we use our sidewalls. So I just, I don't know. But I feel like I'm building more and more stock that I want out and I'm like running out of tables. But I also sell like candles and teethers and like wooden rattles and stuff too that I've also thought about dropping. So I still have to ruminate on that. Oh, this is an important tip. And if you haven't considered it, thank me for it later. After your trial run and after your event, pack up with your next event in mind. Sometimes I'm just beat. So I have the spouse pack up and his goal in life is to just get out of there as fast as possible. He enjoys doing the events. He doesn't enjoy being the muscle behind the events, but I am kind of a delicate flower. And listen, I crochet for a hobby. I'm like not a yard work, physical labor kind of person. I write as my other job. 
So when it comes to heavy lifting, I am useless. Yes, I would die in a zombie apocalypse. I do try to like exercise regularly, but like I can't seem to put on muscle to save my life. I find my like 35 pound toddler like extremely heavy. Okay, you can judge me. I judge me. But like, let's just deal with the fact that I am physically pretty useless. So that's why I sell with my spouse who is not physically useless, um, but also can't do the crochet thing. So I'm like, you know, when he starts pulling his weight, helping me make things, he could do less of the physical work. Uh, that's what I tell. So yeah, afterwards, when I'm beat by all the physical labor of selling to people, I like delicately pack up a couple things, but he does most of it. And he'll just throw things in totes to try to get it down as quick as possible, which bless his heart, I totally understand. But I also try to pack up personally with the next event in mind. So when we get to the next event or we're doing a trial run at our house, I don't have like a display over here and some products in this bin and some products in this bin and like tablecloths in this bin. I try to like group like objects together. So I want all of my like stock in one area, one bin. I want all of like my display pieces for this table in one area or one part of a bin and like so on. So I can like unload in a way that makes sense. Tablecloths always should be on top because apart from the tables, those are the next thing that need to go on the tables. Uh, and it just helps you help yourself later if you pack up that way. So if you've never thought of that, uh, it can be like a real game changer. Now, I do have to like remind him as we're packing up to like just try to like help me, even though he's already gone like above and beyond. But it really does help us for like next time. Another piece of advice for your display that a lot of people overlook is having an emergency bag for things that can like help your display. Now, what should be in your emergency bag? The spare key for your money box, if you have like a lock box, it's gonna happen at some point, you're gonna misplace it. And if you have a, a, an emergency bag with your spare key in it, you're totally set. Try to keep track of your things, obviously, but like make sure your backup is separate. A lot of times when you buy a cash box, the keys are on like the same ring. Don't keep them together. Please don't keep them together because if you lose one, now you've lost both. So that's important to keep in mind. Other things that should be in your emergency bag are things like tape, double-sided tape, bungee cords, rope, and like extra stakes. Now hear me out. A lot of times your tent will come with stakes, but a lot of times your stakes can be like plastic or cheap metal and they can break. But those stakes help your tent stay down if it's really windy. So it never hurts. They're pretty inexpensive to have like an extra set in your bag and they're small. So just keep that in mind. Rope and bungee cords can help like your banner stay down if it gets real windy. It can help you hold down your tent and like your sidewalls if it gets windy. So don't overlook having some extra of those with you because like, I don't know about where you guys live, but when Florida wind picks up, it gets bad. <laughs> I've seen like whole tents like flip and roll over. And the only thing that stops it is usually a tree that's just like karate chopping that tent right in half. So if you want to avoid that, make sure you like pack an emergency bag with that kind of thing in mind. That brings me to the next tip. Make sure no matter what, you have weights on your legs, whether it's windy, rainy, whatever, before your event even starts. Like once tent goes up, your weights should be on your tent. And I try to make sure there's 40 pounds on each leg, no matter where I'm at. Some places that's a requirement, I've even heard of people doing events where more weight is required on each leg, but minimum 40 pounds on each leg. And once again, it sounds extreme, but if you pay the kind of money that I paid for my canopy, it's nice and has like fancy windows. I'd put double the weight if it meant that I was like insured that it wasn't going to blow away <laughs> because I don't want it broken by a tree or God forbid, like taking somebody out. So we use stakes in places that let us, again, not all places let you, and sometimes your stuff's on like pavement, so like stakes aren't an option. But we use stakes every time where we can, and we put our weights out every time. Now tape. Tape is useful to fix anything that breaks. If your stuff is new, maybe it won't break, but you know, maybe it will. I use a lot of like acrylic risers, so in transport, it's potential that they could break. If I have tape and it broke in half, I could just, for that event, put the riser back together and use it until I can replace it. You don't want to be like, well, I needed this for my display and now I have nothing to fix it. And I've now have to modify my whole display to like make it work because I needed that piece. Just have some tape so you can do a quick fix. It might not be perfect, but being able to stick your, to your original plan is typically better than having to like modify in the moment. 
So have some tape. And then my favorite thing is double-sided tape. It's not specifically for fixing things, but that aforementioned wind, it's very helpful to have double-sided tape that's weighted to hold like, I don't know, at least five pounds. I have like Gorilla Tape that has that rating and I use it to stick down like display signs, hold down um, the like mannequin head thing that I have. It does have a decently heavy base but I know it's not going anywhere if I use double-sided tape. And apart from the signs that I have that don't have a solid base, they have like, it's like a wire that's wrapped in like a 360 kind of look. Um, those are the only things with double-sided tape that I've ever had blow over because they're kind of tall and there's not like a whole flat bottom piece. It's just like wire in like a circle. So with double-sided tape. That's the only thing I've ever had blow over. I've not had like a whole sign or like display piece blow over that's been stuck down with the Gorilla Tape. So have double-sided tape. And if you have a canopy and you don't have walls, buy walls because that's been all the like precautions we've taken aside. Oh Putting walls up when it's windy has been our like best like lifesaver when it comes to dealing with wind at events. Now, if you're in like not a windy place, like good for you, but I don't know. We live like fairly coastal and the wind has been a problem a couple times. At one of my more recent events, I had to like help my friend basically like hold her tent down while we took the same precautions that we already do like as soon as we get there. Uh, well, we set them up for her so her tent didn't like later days out of there. So yeah, I will link some of the products that I mentioned like when it comes to displays or like your emergency bag so you guys can shop them. Yes, they are affiliate links. Yes, I will get like a small commission, but we're talking like 3% of like whatever the sale price is. So it's not about me making money. It's about you guys having the things that you need or want for your events. And I have these specific products. So like, I'm not trying to sell you. Like these are things that I actually find helpful and have worked for me. And yeah. And if you like to find out how to price your products the way I price my products, you can watch this video right here and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.